It attacked uh, Run Town itself, in a place where that, that mainly hosted IDPs and the host community. It, we, an estimated population between uh, 15,000 and 20,000 people living around, around Run. So when the uh, attack happened and they were able to, to stabilize uh, some of the cases, it, it was difficult to arrange uh, an evacuation immediately. So the next day on Tuesday, myself with uh, another colleague, We went with the UN helicopter and started the, the medical evacuations. Majority were with children under 12 years old. The airstrike was carried out by the Nigerian army targeting Boko Haram positions. The Air Force has declared it a mistake on their part and has launched an investigation. In eight years, the conflict opposing the army and Boko Haram has displaced within their own country almost three million people. Gutumi Jacob and her ten children live in a camp in Maiduguri. Boko Haram entered our town early one morning. First the men fled and then the women and children. We walked to Maiduguri. It took us two days. Before Boko Haram came, my husband had a job and I sold peanuts. Life's hard here. Aside from organizations like yours that help us, we don't know how or where we can get our food. We're in an area called Muna, which has several camps grouped together. They're huge, like Muna Garage, where 24,000 people live. Principalement depuis l'été 2016. In summer 2016, MSF began organizing distributions, mainly of food. Back then, there were few organizations on hand to provide desperately needed food to all the displaced. There are more organizations here now, so the situation is less critical. But it's still a concern. And these displaced people are often confined in enclosed spaces under military protection so they depend entirely on humanitarian aid. Over one million displaced people are living here. Even if the situation has improved, the United Nations say five million people in northeast Nigeria still don't have enough to eat, and 450,000 children are suffering from severe malnutrition. Situated in southwest Yemen at an altitude of 1,400 meters, Taiz is the country's third largest town. Fighting has made it very difficult to get to Taiz, making food and basic necessities, when available, very expensive. And with the fighting so close, people must take huge risks to get medical treatment. MSF works on both sides of the front line in Taiz, providing medical care in emergency, trauma and maternity units. If I am a mother who is pregnant and wants to go to the mother and child hospital in Hoban to deliver her baby. Um, there are quite a lot of obstacles that I face. There are snipers in quite a lot of high buildings which fire pretty much indiscriminately. If you are a civilian, they don't care. If you're a soldier, they don't care. They will shoot at you regardless. There's also quite a lot of landmines in the area. So if you've managed to find a vehicle to take you from your house to the mother and child hospital, that car may hit a landmine and also If the intensification of fighting starts, you could also be hit by an indiscriminate shell or an airstrike. So this is the decision that people have to take when they want to go to hospital to receive health care. MSF staff witness this violence daily. In 2016, MSF attended in Taiz 5,300 deliveries, gave 31,900 antenatal consultations and admitted over 2,500 malnourished children. The teams also treated 10,700 war wounded. Afghanistan, Syria, Nigeria. Bombings in conflict zones spare neither civilians nor humanitarian aid workers. But how to identify who's responsible? 
and how to get them to recognize their responsibility. Drawing on analyses of video footage and photographs and using its expertise in architecture and cartography, research agency Forensic Architecture helps to establish the facts and ascertain who's to be held to account. Faced with denials from those who carried out the bombings of hospitals in Syrian town Mahat al numan MSF called on the agency to shed light on the circumstances of the attacks. One of the hallmarks of the Syrian conflict is the strategy of deliberate and almost systematic bombing of medical facilities. We thought it would be worth getting more evidence to uncover this strategy. The idea wasn't necessarily to go to trial or obtain formal proof, but to increase the political cost for those behind the bombings. Forensic architecture's input means we can call on the media and thereby possibly reduce the risk of further attacks so we can continue to deliver our medical aid. How does it work? In this particular case, forensic architecture used amateur videos taken during the bombings of the hospitals in Marat and Numan. By comparing images and camera angles, they were able to pinpoint the location. Based on camera positions and people's shadows, forensic architecture can calculate the precise time of an attack and the chronology of events. Audio recordings can also provide evidence. This evidence corroborates the shadow analysis and the time of the bombings. Forensic architecture has used its findings to confirm that there were repeated strikes only a few minutes apart, proof of the deliberate and relentless targeting of civilians and aid organizations. Systemizing this work of reconstruction, not only in the event of any future bombings, but also drawing on archives of these past three years, will enable MSF to decipher and condemn military strategies when they're in violation of the law. Twenty-six countries, ninety programs, eleven thousand victims of sexual violence, ninety percent of them female, most under the age of eighteen. These statistics from 2015 illustrate the scale of the problem MSF teams have to contend with, but they reveal none of the trauma and the thousands of lives shattered by sexual violence. What can MSF teams do to help these people and, when necessary, protect them? The clinic in Mathari in Kenya is open 24-7. Located in the heart of Nairobi's slum district, it's MSF's largest program for victims of sexual violence. The staff's priority is to provide a caring, safe and confidential environment for people who have been subjected to this kind of trauma, however long ago it may have happened. However, victims need to get medical care within 72 hours to effectively combat the risk, for example, of HIV infection. So MSF teams have reached out to communities living near the clinic to combat the stigma associated with sexual violence and to let them know care is available. They also work closely with other actors, starting with the police, to ensure that victims of sexual violence are referred to the clinic as quickly as possible. A helpline and an ambulance service facilitate access to the clinic for people without any means of transport, especially at night. During their first visit, victims are given psychological support and medical care if they have any physical injuries. Not all patients find it easy to talk about what has happened, but it can be easier to confide in a member of staff trained in how to listen, advise and reassure them. Patients are also tested for HIV and are given preventive treatment to reduce the risk of infection if they've been exposed to the AIDS virus. They receive treatment for sexually transmitted infections, are vaccinated against hepatitis B and tetanus, and women can obtain emergency contraception. 
Soon after, they can do a pregnancy test and choose to have a safe abortion or to be referred to a clinic for antenatal care. The teams also seek to protect victims. Many of them know their aggressor or even live under the same roof, in which case MSF can assist them with short-term accommodation. They also help patients to defend themselves against their aggressors. Medical certificates are delivered during consultations for victims to use if they wish to file a complaint and MSF staff can give evidence in court when called on to do so. Opened in 2008, the clinic in Mathari has extended its activities, namely reaching out to the communities to raise awareness and facilitating access. This has led to an increase in new patients, from 150 in 2011 to 2,400 in 2015. This effort to facilitate access to care for victims of sexual violence is ongoing. A program of decentralised care necessitating training Ministry of Health nursing staff has also been set up to ensure that all victims can get appropriate treatment easily. As an OBGYN, I am concerned about the global gag rule. Working with MSF, I have been in countries where abortion is illegal or difficult to access, and I've seen the consequences of unsafe abortion. When organizations are not able to discuss family planning and abortion with patients, that actually means more unintended pregnancies, more abortions, and more deaths from unsafe abortion. Women might have trouble accessing abortion because it's illegal or because they don't have a safe abortion care provider near them. And I've seen directly myself the consequences of unsafe abortion. I've seen women come in with uh, hemorrhage and they bled so much at home that they require massive blood transfusions to save their lives. I've seen women come in with a perforated uterus. Um, I saw one woman come in with um, what I found to be a piece of a stick left in her uterus from an unsafe abortion that someone in the community had done. And if that woman had not come into me, she would have died of her abortion. When women don't have access to safe abortion care, they resort to really unsafe methods and really horrifying methods. And unless we're able to adequately counsel patients and make sure they're accessing safe care, they turn to anyone that they can in desperation.